Welcome back to Trafficking Truths, our Mythbuster campaign. I'm Rebecca Bender, and today, myth number two is going to be trafficking always requires a sex act. I know that might be a little bit of a gripping topic, but the truth is, is that there's all different types of human trafficking. There's internet crimes against children, child exploitation, child trafficking. There's all different types of what is commercial exploitation exactly when a third party has to exchange something of monetary value. There's all these nuances and layers. And so today I've brought on three guests to talk about the definitions and the laws and why it matters because recruitment tactics are dependent upon the type of crime and the type of predatory behavior. Today, I want to welcome Senior Deputy District Attorney from the state of California, Nico Anderson. I have also brought on the Commercial Sexual Exploitation Coordinator of the Department of Human Services out of the Child Welfare Office, Liz Alston, and of course, our resident expert, Elizabeth Scaife. All right, I'm so excited. I want to welcome today, thank you so much for coming, Senior Deputy District Attorney of Fresno County, Nico Anderson. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to talk to you. Yeah, you are such an um, incredible prosecutor. I've got to see you in action. I'm always like cheering you on. I think, I think I'm your biggest cheerleader out in the out in the hallway doing like, yeah, go, go. So I wanted to see if you could just share with everyone today about a little bit more about kind of, you know, your experience as a prosecutor and a, a senior district attorney, and just share a little bit more about yourself before I jump into some of our, some of our questions today. Oh, okay, absolutely. Uh, let's see, I am a senior deputy district attorney for Fresno County. Uh, the unit that I'm currently assigned to is the human trafficking unit. And we solely uh, only prosecute human trafficking cases. Those cases come with uh, other charges, as you know, uh, sexual assault charges, gang charges, and other charges, but it's a human trafficking uh, unit. Uh, before that, I prosecuted domestic violence and gang crimes. I've been there um, 14 years, 13 years? Wow. 13 to 14 years, <laughs> somewhere in there. Um, and, you know, prosecuted violent felonies and those type of things. Um, I taught a class at the uh, law school uh, on human trafficking law and policy that I developed so that the people who are just entering into the legal field can have some experience and education on the topic so they can maybe recognize it if, if need be and know how to act if they do see it. Um, and in addition to that, I do, uh, you know, training for some of our police officers here and throughout the state. And I serve on a board of directors for one of our local nonprofits that deal with uh, human trafficking issues. So human trafficking kind of is my main focus. That's your main thing. And you're so good at it. What a wealth of knowledge that you bring. Tell us real quick, maybe you could share just for fun, not that this topic's fun, but people are engaged by stories. Stories moves people sometimes more than just data and facts, although we know it's really important to share accurate data and, data and facts. Share one of your toughest cases and um, maybe something that you learned from, from that. Um, I would think one of my toughest cases was probably one of the first human trafficking cases that I took to trial. And it was one that had two victims, a minor and, a, and an adult victim. And it was one where you were the actual expert um, that was called to trial, uh, called to testify in that case. So it's the Hugh Goodwin, I'm sorry. Okay. Her um, trial. That was one of the most difficult ones. Um, the, the most difficult hurdle though that I had in that case was our minor victim. And that's what you would, what, what your testimony helped out uh, so much with the fact that um, she had uh, what can only really be described as a psychological breakdown at an earlier hearing and was not able to appear when it came time for trial and to be able to find the evidence to put forward to a jury to explain the circumstances without her present and then making the determination to not even attempt to call her because of that psychological impact that the prior hearing had was one of those difficult um, difficulties. But we came out successful in that trial and that was a long one and a yeah. lot of lessons learned in that. And I think the, the probably the biggest lesson learned in that was to really think outside the box when it comes to how you put forward your evidence and how you provide that you know, to a jury and 
and and I kind of look at it and it's and it's um, a little different like in a I don't want to say holistic way because that sounds really like touchy feely but to put forth the essence as much as you can of the truth of what actually happened so not just like cold facts as to what happened but how it was how it impacted the victim any witnesses that you have that can explain that so to do it in kind of a, a multi-dimensional type of way so right that's good by all the senses so not to get too like weird on you but to really let the jury try to as much as you can understand what actually happened in that case and that was one of the ones that we had to really pull in our back to do that yeah, i mean that case i didn't know that would be the one you this was not a setup i did not know that would be the one that you gave an example of um but that case is one that i have referred to several times to to kind of brag on you about and you just really pivoted when the when the victim was not able to testify she started having a breakdown on the stand and you and the judge and everyone was like what like she needs services she's not ready definitely wouldn't have been ready to undergo cross-examination and you pivoted and you thought quickly on your feet and you pulled evidence that did not rely on victim testimony you pulled the body cam footage from the law enforcement officer that arrived on the scene to, to review the victim jumping in the car afraid when the trafficker arrived at the motel. I mean, I was like, look, I was really impressed. So I use you as an example whenever we're training of like in, a, in, in state of California versus <laughs> prosecutor Anderson was able to pivot quickly. I mean, we do, we do use you as, you did great. I mean, was that hard to immediately have to find evidence, not just find it, but I think it's a great example that you don't always have to rely on victim testimony to prosecute a case. And now there was other victims that were able to testify. That was just one, but, um, but I don't know if that's normal. And I know we're kind of pushing to try to not, because victims aren't always ready. And that's, I think a great, a great lesson from this. So. Right. And, and for, for me, it's, it's normal in the sense that because I work domestic violence, I'm used to a victim not being cooperative. Mm. So I'm used to that you know, that dynamic in the court and have, you know, having to figure out a way to go forward without either cooperation or participation. Um, but I think what was probably the most difficult part because with use of like body cam footage, generally it's a, um, you know, it's not allowed because it's a hearsay uh, exception. It's a hearsay statement, so it's not allowed in court. Mm. So to to get it in and be able to make the arguments that it was not just uh, the hearsay exception, the hearsay statement, but there was exceptions that apply. And honestly, I think the biggest thing that I would advise any prosecutor who is like tackling one of these cases is to try every piece of evidence that you want to get in think of every possible reason that it can come in and just try because a lot of people when we discuss the case in the office would say you know that's not coming in and in for the majority of the time they were right because it didn't come in in its entirety but we were able to get like a 20 minute sec or two minute um, segment or a fragmented segment of it and it was just enough to give the jurors an idea of what was going on so good really good so obviously this is a trafficking myth buster campaign and one of the questions that I was going to ask you to come on today and thanks again for taking your time I know you're busy um, in between your virtual trials right now but share with me if you could a little bit on you know, I know, you know, but maybe people that aren't tuning in, you know way more than I do. But when you're trying a trafficking case, there's kind of specifics between what's a minor, what's required to be proven for a minor that's involved in human trafficking, an adult. And there's also a little bit of some nuances it with, um, you know, a lot of people think human trafficking is smuggling across borders. Um, so do people have to be moved across borders for it to be considered trafficking? And then also the, the fourth category that we see a lot is um, the exploitation oftentimes of homeless young people, whether they're minors or adults. And if there's not that third party perpetrator mm -hmm. that's profiting off of monetary value, is it trafficking or is it exploitation? It's all a little bit this big spectrum. And so people that don't know these details just hear trafficking and jump on it. But sometimes there's a lot more little kind of nuances with all of these categories. Can you share a little about that? Oh, absolutely. I guess the biggest difference between the cases involving minors and uh, adults is uh, the law itself. So the, uh, the law that applies to minors doesn't necessarily require that the uh, act of trafficking or the commercial sex act, sex act is completed. It can just be the attempt. 
And if the attempt is found mm. with the intent to uh, solicit someone to, to force a minor into commercial sex act, then the crime is committed. So the attempt uh, satisfies the elements for that crime. Uh, the all, other distinction with minors is um, when there's force, fear, violence, menace, uh, duress, anything of that nature involved, then the exposure as it relates to California law is a lot higher. So exposure when, it, when there's the violence or um, coercion, force, any of those things that I described, when that's present, then the case becomes uh, a life exposure case. When it's not, then it's exposure is 12 years. So there's a okay. really big difference between um, the two different circumstances when it relates to minors. So uh, if as it relates exposed to, to harm, threats of harm, then yes. you can get an exposure, which is a harsher sentence, har harsher on the sentencing guidelines. Please. Absolutely, and, and that also includes uh, coercion, which would include uh, furnishing the minor with uh, uh, an illegal substance. Okay. So, and that's because that's so commonplace. That's one of the things that sometimes is overlooked, but that can be a fact to show uh, conversion or not um, that force that's needed for that higher exposure. Wow, so there's a lot of little nuances really that you have to prove, whether it's, were they exposed to any kind of threat or harm or, sub or substance? That you have to prove that, though, right? That is that harder to find? It, it can be, and that's one of the reasons why it was so difficult in the case that I brought up before, because the force was there and the threats were there when we had the witness statement. So when that minor victim, before she broke down and she reported to officers what happened, she clearly stated facts that would constitute force, violence, duress, everything of that nature. But when she was unable to um, testify because of her her uh, psychological state, then then we had to find other ways to prove that she had suffered duress or was afraid or was forced or was subject to violence without her reporting it. And in that case, because there weren't any outside witnesses to any of the violence or any of the threats, there weren't any text streams that were threatening, mm -hmm. um, it made it more difficult. And that's why that little snippet, I think it might've been like 30 seconds, 40 seconds, of two different snippets of the body cam was so important because at one point you see her um, cry on the body cam and say that he's going to kill me. And then another uh, point you see her uh, visibly afraid to speak to officers and request to be taken to a car because um, he's he was going to harm her if she said anything. And that was enough to be able to communicate to the jury exactly the state of mind she was under when these uh, when the crime was committed. So that's wow. why it was so helpful. So tell us the difference then about, you know, we hear, we sometimes we think the general public pictures human trafficking as kidnapped children smuggled across borders, locked in rooms. Can you talk a little bit about the crossing of borders, if that's required at all, and exploitation um, as it pertains to maybe not having a third party uh, perpetrator that's you know profiting monetarily. It does exploitation of at-risk populations equate to human trafficking charges or or not sometimes? Well okay as it relates to smuggling but smuggling border crossing is not an element and it and smuggling is actually a federal offense so that's a federal crime and that's a crime against the border itself. Okay. Um, and human trafficking is a crime against the person. So it's the exploitation or the okay. deprivation of that person's liberty to force them into either commercial sex acts or to force them into forced labor or uh, provide uh, services uh, due to force. So trafficking is a crime against the person, not a crime against the border. Um, and one of the biggest misconceptions is that a lot of force is normally used to um, to cause the victim to be in this circumstance. And it, it can happen and it does, but uh, it's not required for the crime to be committed. And it's actually a lot less common than other modes of uh, manipulation and, and coercion. So um, violence and um, the way we kind of describe it when we're um, speaking to the jury is that there are so many different recruitment tactics and different recruitment styles that the one that has always been the most difficult to combat is the one that doesn't use violence initially when that 
relationship is there and they call it the you know the romeo pimp or or uh, the boyfriend pimp when that relationship is established and the victim is under the misbelief that she's doing this voluntarily and i say she right. but it can be he also and then when they attempt to stop a lot of times they're faced with violence or yes. as it progresses the violence occurs yeah. but it can be very difficult when the victim herself or himself don't believe that they were forced to do it, that they are manipulated into believing that it was their own decision. Yeah, it's so true. We had a girl, one of the clients that we served in our um, online school that we run, We, I remember chatting with her about her situation and she said, um, I'm not really sure if I was trafficked because my, my man, my pimp, um, he never beat me. And I thought, well, just because, and I, my answer to her was, because you never said no. <laughs> like we don't know how violent he would have gotten had he refused to comply had you tried to run he didn't need to you uh, you agreed when he just maybe got intimidating or he agreed by promising you um certain you know needs being met financial physical um you know oh, i'll give you a place to stay if you and you said and you you complied and so that was really hard for her for a minute to kind of feel like well my situation doesn't feel like all the other girls because i never got I wasn't in what felt like domestic violence to her or to people that feel like they're in relationships, you know, sometimes that can feel um, like domestic violence. So that was hard for her, but she got it eventually. She was like, oh, you're right. I just complied with, with a threat. And he didn't have to eventually actually um, perform the threat, right? And that's why one of the elements is not just violence, but threat of harm. So if the threat is there, um, then that can be enough. And a lot of times, um, the victim can see the trafficker hurt someone else. Mm -hmm. So that trafficker never needs to lay a hand on that particular victim because they already know what that trafficker is capable of. Right. So they know if they don't comply, then what the other person got that they might eventually get. So, it, so at least in California, the law is um, stated to where that the court allows the jury to consider a totality of all the circumstances. So it can, it can, the jury can consider the victims, uh, if there's any disabilities or psychological issues, uh, if there's an age discrepancy, if there's a power discrepancy, a lot of times, unfortunately, and it's so tragic that we have traffickers who are also, you know, family members. And normally the ones that I have most recently are father, daughter type of dynamic. So you might not need a lot of uh, violence there, but that dynamic is there. So all the totality of all the circumstances are considered in order to determine whether or not there was convert coercion and that's why it's so important to paint that full picture because the, it's the entire dynamic that really can can convey what's actually happening so crazy yeah it reminds me of we i worked a case in oregon where the victim um he did end up abusing her throughout their time of victimization but her biggest threat of harm that she complied to is the threat of harming her children and there, it wasn't just a threat. He, it ended up when obviously his criminal record came into play because he took the stand, um, which it would not have had he not taken the stand. So it's his own fault. But um, he had been arrested and done prison time for child abuse of her two children. He actually done prison time for for physically harming these little kids. And so when she got to Oregon, it didn't. It, he only had to do that that one time. And now she's like, don't, don't, just the threat of it was enough to get her to comply. It was really sad, but the fam, the, the father daughter cases, man, it's heartbreaking. And it, I listened to an interview once by the daughter of, I think Warren Jeffs was his name. He was that the polygamist that was arrested a long time ago. She wrote a book and she did this interview. And I remember one thing she said, she said that when her, her, the children were babies, that the dad, the, the main polygamous cult leader, he would hold them under the faucet of running water until it was hard for them to breathe and then he'd pull them out. And she said he did that so that they grew up with this subconscious sense of fear of their father, but no memory as to why. And I thought, how twisted do you have to be to abuse someone at an age before memory, but enough trauma that they would innately know there's fear there. And it's just crazy. So I'm, I'm glad to hear that California allows that totality. Do you know states that don't? Is that something as people begin to look at policy and vacator laws and all these other things that come into play? Do you know states that don't allow totality? 
Um, from my understanding, and I'm not familiar with a lot of state laws beyond California, but from my understanding, as far as it relates to human trafficking, the totality of the circumstances is something that should be commonly considered. Okay. So for the, for the human trafficking, because anytime you um, have the elements of force and fear and violence, you should be able to you know, describe the circumstances that bring that about. Thank you so much for your time today. I know you're really good. No busy. problem. Thank you so much for having me. Hello. Well, welcome to my next interview of Mythbusters. I am so excited, you guys, to bring you a good friend of mine, but more than that, a leading subject matter expert in this field. Please welcome Elizabeth Scaife. Hi, everyone. I'm <laughs> so excited to be here, and thank you for the extra claps and snaps. Yes. Uh, <laughs> It's a pleasure to be here. I guess I should say a little bit about myself, just yes. so everyone knows, yes, who I Tell am. Tell the viewers who you are, what you bring, what you've been doing. I'm so excited for them to get so much truth from you. Um, but I want them to know all the things that you have done for so long and how you kind of gathered this wealth of knowledge. Okay, great. I think I can cover that. So I've actually been in the nonprofit sector for 20 years. Since I, since I graduated college, I have worked in the nonprofit sector and always with vulnerable and marginalized populations um, from international students on campus to uh, Hispanic immigrants in our local community to international projects set up. And then ultimately, I spent a year traveling the world, which in, in 2007, which introduced me to the issue of human trafficking firsthand and commercial sexual exploitation of women and children. And that ignited something in me that I, I didn't even know existed, you know? And so I found myself uh, hands and feet on the ground working with women coming out of the sex industry, and it changed me. Um, it changed me dra dramatically, actually. Mm -hmm. And so when I returned from that trip after several months, I started looking directly for a career in this field, and I took a job in D.C. And I've been here for over 11 years now, working specifically and very, um, very diligently on issues surrounding anti-trafficking policy, awareness, training, capacity building, strategic planning, program development, you name it. I've, I've had my hands in it um, for the last 11 years. And I've worked for two international nonprofits to do that. And then about a year ago, I launched my own contracting and consulting business, which, which I'm struggling through the pandemic on right now. But I, I, I enjoy the freedom to be able to work with so many different organizations and especially survivor run organizations to help with projects as they come. Damn. And we love you. You work um, personally in depth with a ton of survivor leaders. You're, you're one of the most respected allies and advocates in this, in this space. Um, and you sit on a couple boards with the different international association on human trafficking investigate. Tell us more. I'm, you're not telling everything you do because you do so much. I know. Well, I've worked, um, I've worked on at least two directly liaised on two human trafficking task forces. I do sit on the board of a small nonprofit that provides services and support to survivors, therapeutic support and scholarships to children of survivors. I also sit on the advisory board for the International Association of Human Trafficking Investigators that you mentioned, and their nonprofit focused on equipping and training law enforcement around the world. Um, I've been a, a national international trainer on a variety of subjects for all sorts of professional audiences. I started and launched the largest child sex trafficking country in, I'm sorry, child sex trafficking conference in the country. Um, gosh, I don't know. I've written several training guides and awareness resources. And I've done you're the ones you're known so much for and I know gets replayed on like TV sometimes is the oh, yeah. trafficking because we get to laugh about like oh I know something just re-aired I'm getting some creepos yeah. in my DMs <laughs> creepos that's right I always know that there's a show that I did actually I loved it it was a it was the um, Gangsters America's Most Evil TV show and it does it does re-air every year at least once and I always get some random creepos friending me on social media. I was a subject matter expert on that show and I was focused on a local gang trafficker who was really prolific in, in his trafficking enterprise here in Virginia. So it was an honor to be a part of that show but it does come with some creepers. <laughs> yeah well you've done a ton. You you I think a part of running and creating one of the largest anti-trafficking conferences in the country um, at one point, you, that gave you um, extreme insight onto a variety of tracks, whether it's law enforcement or medical, survivor leadership, policy, like there's so many, you literally have had 
not just your hands in a lot of pots or fires or prongs at whatever the analogy is, but you've like been fully immersed in all of these things. It's not just like you've dabbled in it all. You've been fully immersed in all of these variety of lanes. Um, I can't wait to start asking you some questions. Are you ready? Uh, I think so. Okay, here we go. Um, I want to start off by asking you a little bit right now. Obviously, this is a MythBuster campaign. Our um, online presence in the human trafficking space is getting inundated with with more misconceptions about trafficking than ever before. And yeah. so, I was hoping you could break it down for us a little bit on this spectrum of like spectrum of child exploitation. It's it's broad and it's a big umbrella. We want people to know, like, what does one mean when someone says child pedophile ring versus a human trafficking victim in your community? Are they the same? Tell us more about this giant spectrum. Yeah, you know, it's, it's, you're absolutely right. And I think I was this way, if I could be honest, I, I was, I fell into the same, the same manner of thinking the same concepts around these issues you know when you're when you're not working in this field and you're not an expert on any one issue then you only know a little bit about it. you know if i tried if somebody tried to explain if some random person tried to define what malaria was for example then then they heard of it but they don't really know much about it right they may know it's a mosquito-borne illness and it's kind of the same with trafficking bizarre analogy but if you pick any subject right we only know what we've seen and heard from our friends or on tv or something like that and unfortunately the things that get spread around are the things that grab the most attention, especially in the media. And so it can be naturally very sensational. So people across the board tend to think, and this is every training audience, you know, even professionals who work in this field, if they don't understand, um, you know, we're not picking on all the community members, but they, they tend to think that trafficking is something that happens only across international borders, that it only impacts foreign nationals, that it's only females, that it's only related to sex. And then if you boil that down, they tend to think that all people who participate in it, or at least in purchasing sex acts with a child, that they're all pedophiles, or that they're all involved in pornography. There's just a lot of blanket statements across the board. So I think some of it is, it's helpful when we can break down the definitions. And if you want to do that, um, I'm certainly happy to do that for the audience, or we could touch specifically on the pedophilia aspect. What should we tackle first? <laughs> which, part, which direction do we go? Um, Gosh, there's just so, it's so much. And I know, I mean, literally you could teach an entire college class on some of this stuff. So we're, we're trying to get it to you guys in, in 60 minutes yeah. and we're even going to extrapolate some of that for the IGTV only, and then hope you go watch the whole interview. So, um, tell us what you think is the most important. We know kind of about minors and adults and that difference between coercion based on minor adults from, from um, Miko Anderson out of Fresno DA. But tell us then a little bit then about that spectrum of, of child sex rings, child pedophilia. These are terms we're hearing a lot in yeah. the trafficking space, especially with um, Epstein and, and, and Weinstein and all the things that are happening. Help the average person break it down a little bit. Sure, absolutely. So I, I would start with saying there's a difference and they and they tend to get blended together and in a community awareness standpoint, but they're very different things between trafficking and actually exploitation. And then within exploitation, there are branches of that, specifically sexual exploitation, sexual exploitation of children, right? And so between child sex trafficking and child sexual exploitation, the one difference that, that I would wish that every person would keep in mind is that trafficking involves a commercial component. So something is exchanged, something of value. And that, that is actually what sets trafficking apart from every other crime against children, is that something of value is exchanged and it, for, for a sex act with that child, right? And so on the sexual exploitation side of things, pornography is a form of sexual exploitation. It can also be a form of child trafficking when something of value is exchanged um, for that sex act or the depiction of the sex act with the child, with the child themselves, right? But none of that really matters, right? Because at the end of the day, I think the, the biggest buckets are if, if a, all, all of these are forms of, of child abuse, specifically child sexual abuse. And that's what we want to keep in mind, right? But as far as the idea that anyone who's perpetrating a sex act against a child is a pedophile, that is a very common misconception because the, the true definition of a pedophile, it's, it is a psychological disorder or a deviant sexual disorder for someone who is attracted to a prepubescent youth. And that's typically 
now that depends on the child's development, but typically falls in with kids under 11 years of age. And so pedophiles are targeting young children and whether or not it's related to trafficking is irrelevant, that's who they go after. And they're actually clinical terms. Most of us don't know them. Uh, they're a little weird and they're not commonly used, but if you're curious, then you can look up hebophilia, which starts with an H, hebophilia, which, um, which refers to the kids who are in that, in that sort of developing stage from 11 to 15 years. And then there's a term for people who really enjoy um, are attracted to, sexually attracted to kids who are 15 to 19, and that's ebophilia. And those terms are not commonly thrown around because pedophile is something that we became very accustomed to hearing about in the 90s. And so it's just a term. So it's the idea so that all, all of these are pedophiles. Pedophiles is, mm. is first, it's just wrong, right? And the, and I think that the, the extra layer, the problematic layer I find is that when we continue to repeat the same errors right in in understanding the situation then it just reveals your lack of knowledge uh, about the facts of the case and and it and it discredits you unfortunately and so when people call police to report that there's a pedophile next door who's purchasing sex acts with a child then it sounds uh, it sounds less credible right than someone who is more informed and can and can give the facts of the case so it's best Plus, not to make i think it, it leads to different what it leads to different ways you want to protect your kids, right? So for me, I have a five-year-old, what I'm going to do with her to keep her safe and what I warn her about and what I protect her from is going to be very different than my 20-year-old that's off at college. I need to talk to her about different things and different ways to keep herself safe and what to do when she's in situations that feel uncomfortable. I mean, and both, both matter, but what I, what I educate my kids on are really different based on the predatory behavior and Absolutely. recruitment tactic of a specific age. And that's why I wanted to, to partly do this myth buster. It's because it feels like everyone started using this one hashtag because they're only picturing this one way. And what happens is not only does it, does it like you said, not help with reporting, but it really helps us as parents to not envision all these other ways that we're actually not keeping our kids yeah. safe because we're warning them against, we're warning, warning our 20 year old about the tactics that are used on seven year olds. And that's, yeah, exactly. it's not going to be the same. So it's yeah. really important to know. Okay. It, it is. And so even just tag, like teasing that out a little bit, as far as recruitment tactics, you know, for younger kids, and this is, and you can find this online, statistically speaking, when we talk about missing and exploited kids, the tactics um, that predators employ for those different age brackets are all cl classically very different naturally because they appeal to different vulnerabilities. They appeal to different awareness and educational levels, and they appeal to different ways that the child can protect themselves. And so, yeah. you know, you and I have discussed this in the past when parents, are so polar focused on micro focused on on a, a less than one percent chance of, of this kind of person targeting this age bracket you're overlooking all these other components that that the kids are exposed to over here majority of child sex offenders are actually people known to the child and here we are expecting them to be some stranger danger you know, um, pedophile coming after my, chasing after us in Target and all the other stories we hear that are spread around on social media and they just perpetuate unrealistic circumstances. Right. So talk to us a little bit. I mean, I know that sometimes we hear when we start trying to educate people about this, we get people that will say things like, well, you know, sensational, at least it's helping you raise awareness and we all want to be safe. And you're like, yeah, that's true. But I think we just made a pretty good case on to why it's important to know how to keep your kid realistically safe though, and not the 1%. But what I'd love for you to also talk about is, is what happens between buyer and trafficker. So you talked about in order for it to be this, you know, child abuse is broad and then narrowed down into these varying types of exploitation. What is that commercial component with that third party? And what happens, I love to hear you talk about like when things changed and buyer, buyers started be, being called traffickers because that was yeah. a new shift for us as a field to be like, wait a minute, he's either a buyer or a seller. He can't be both. And you're like, whoop, actually the law changed and it can. Tell us about that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, back in 2000, when the Trafficking Victims Protection Act was passed, the definition that was applied to trafficking for the United States, as far as we're concerned, and then largely the same globally, is that it involves a recruitment, transporting, provision, obtaining, and harboring of a person for labor or services, or unless the child is under 18, right? Um, 
but there are some there have been some discrepancies and and different interpretations across the NGO sector and especially in the courtroom on what some of those words mean because if you've ever been involved in legislative work at all you can find how frustrating and how important at the same time it is that that the appropriate wording is used when a law is established because that law is then applied to a crime or a case and then it is then interpreted in a court right so the judge and the jury interpret the law now whether they interpret it in the spirit that it was crafted um, it may may or may not be done the same way and so imagine this well-crafted law that gets tested in a court and you have maybe some really amazing law enforcement who've arrested a sex buyer and they've charged them under the trafficking law because they believe that the word obtain and their prosecutor believes the word obtain refers to a buyer. It goes to the court system and the court says, you know, actually we don't believe Congress intended the word to apply. The, the context of the law clearly applies to sellers and only sellers. Well, even though they arrested them under the spirit of their interpretation, the law declares it something different. And so that actually did happen. And the, for those of us in the anti-trafficking sector who have been fighting against demand and recognizing buyers as equally complicit in the crime of trafficking as the traffickers themselves, we saw a very brave U.S. attorney back in, I think it was 2011, Brendan Johnson in South Dakota, um, who was doing quite a lot of stings with uh, the motorcycle rallies there. And they charged, they bravely charged some guys for um, purchasing sex under the federal law. And that was huge. And so it ended up going, they, they were convicted, uh, they were prosecuted, and then they appealed. And their first appeal agreed with the defendants and said, you're right, they, they used too broad of a definition. Um, we are acquitting the case. Well, the, the government, the U.S. attorney pushed it again, and they appealed it. So it went all the way to the Eighth Circuit Court. And the Eighth Circuit Court miraculously upheld the original decision, which was a landmark case, right? Mm -hmm. Because now we have case law that supports a court saying, no, the interpretation applies to a buyer. But that wasn't enough for NGOs because we didn't want the issue to continue to be a problem. And so just, uh, I think it was five years ago, we went back as we do every couple years and we look at the law and we say like, what needs to be adjusted and amended and fixed. And so they went back to make it crystal clear and they added four more words to the trafficking definition. So it's no longer just recruiting, harboring, transporting, obtaining, and providing. It is now also advertising, patronizing, soliciting, and maintaining. So all of those things, now we know for sure, buyers can be prosecuted and there should be no confusion. So if someone does any of those things, harboring, transporting, procuring, you said them all, I'm just obtaining. Yep all the things all the things if someone does any of those things they can be charged as a trafficker if there's a commercial component involved or just at all absolutely so there has to be a commercial component involved and there also have to be the elements of force fraud and coercion so it was it's kind of like putting this three-piece puzzle together we need force fraud or coercion we need commercial something exchanged for monetary value drugs we food and we need harboring transporting blah, 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 blah. Yep. The okay. action, the means, and the purpose is what we like to say. So talk us through a little bit. I really want you to touch on this Epstein case because I know it, this is a big one. Um, I know I was shocked when we saw him charged with trafficking. And I think this, this, this description of the law that you just gave for everybody is a really good preface as to why. Um, and also that we talked about this before, but it was like probably going federal because of the multiple places that this yeah. expired. Um, but some... Talk us through this case a little bit. I mean, I don't want to spend too much time because I have a lot more things I want to, I want to ask you, but I love some of your perspective on, on Epstein and how this actually wasn't really a unique situation. Correct. Yeah, you know, I, I think everyone's shocked by it uh, for a few different reasons. First of all, that he's this incredibly wealthy, influential person who rubs shoulders with incredibly wealthy and influential people around the world, especially here in the United States, um, that there was an exponential number of victims involved, that he continued to get reported at least a few times that we know of, and every single time he was able to get off the hook for it, right? Right. And the, the, the details of the case are shocking for, I don't think there's any of us that, that are shocked. It's like, you're shocked and you're not shocked because- well, Because to us, he seems like a- happen. Yeah, and he seems like a standard buyer. You're like, I get buyers like that all day long. Like they totally. have hundreds of girls they buy in their lifetime. Like he didn't seem like, he wouldn't have fit what I would have considered a trafficker. He would have fit a buyer. He is a classic 
He's a classic Correct. player. Yes. And he had someone that we would say is a classic bottom within Jelaine Maxwell, yep. just because they don't fit the standard stereotype that we typically see running street level criminal enterprises. Uh, they are still the same people. They are still sex buyer slash trafficker and bottom slash trafficker slash recruiter, all the things. Right. So I, I mean, I, other than I think what people, like you said, it's a common, it's a common confusing point as to how he could be the trafficker in the case, but it, it does fall to the federal definition. And, and he had girls all over the world and his various different properties. So it is technically a federal case. Thank goodness. It probably would have gone federal anyway. Um, it's so easy to make a case federal. It's just that most cases, most cases don't meet the threshold for what they're looking for. Well, and I want to say when you said he had girls, I want to, I want to clarify for the average listener, he had phone numbers and access to connect with girls. He wasn't like holding girls in basements Correct. and all of these for, in, on his island, which I think Correct. the media has really done a job at spinning this case um, when but he had access to what he would consider regular, be re regular in terms of consistent, right? Like I had regulars when I was in the game. We have regulars. You have regulars that call you every time they're in town. And Here's from, the, from this side of it, being one of the people that would be bought, what we know about wanting to consistently create regulars is that it allows you to not be exposed to possible arrest. That's the part that I think, for me, I would assume that he really leaned on. Because when you can continually reach out to people that you know are not cops, you're running less and less risk of being potentially found. And so regular regulars, quote unquote, regulars are, are, I'm sure there's a much better definition for that, but that's what we called it in the street. So I don't know. You know what I'm trying to say though? Like, I think he kept regular victims around because it would decrease his risk of exposure potentially, but every addict needs new, fresh yeah. meat. Yeah. I mean, that's the problem with buyers. That's the problem with buyers. And it's also, uh, they, they consider themselves, if you ever, if you ever do any buyer research or you follow around buyers and I've done quite about quite a bit and in, in my last few years, um, just to study and train on the issues and the profiles and, and their mindsets, you know, buyers, those who are habitual sex buyers consider themselves hobbyists. And it is like collecting anything that we would typically see people doing as, as a, a hobby. hobby. Yeah, absolutely. Wow. And they, they, but they consider themselves collecting encounters. And so they want diversity. They want different kinds. They want different sizes and shapes and looks and ages. They want all the things. And thank you so much for all your work, for all your passion. And I cannot wait to see um, how this all, this pendulum swings back and all of the, the yeah. policy and great work that you can get to continue to do in all of the different lanes um, to combat trafficking. Thank you. All right. Welcome. I'm so excited. To have with us today for this MythBuster is Elizabeth Alston, the CSEC coordinator, which stands for the Child Sexual Commercial Sexual Exploitation of Children. I can't even talk. The Commercial Sexual Exploitation of Children, the CSEC coordinator for the Oregon Department of Human Services Child Welfare Office. Elizabeth, what a title. <laughs> I know. You should see my email address. It's even longer. <laughs> oh my gosh. I, you're usually just say like CSEC coordinator, CSEC coordinator, because it's easier. But you like work for the Child Welfare Department of Human Services, and tell us what the role entails a little bit. Sure. So it's really my role to uh, make sure that we are up to date in the procedures and processes that we're using for child welfare for the state of Oregon. I staff cases when we have really complicated cases and we need connections to law enforcement that um, that becomes my role. I try to make sure, like I said, just that we have the most recent up-to-date information. So for example, when COVID broke out, I spent a lot of time gathering research and data from all over the U.S. and even internationally and creating a training for our staff so that we know what, um, what we may see in terms of trafficking going forward or during the outbreak. Um, and I assess any policy or legislation that goes into um, the Oregon State Legislature uh, in order to assess whether or not it would have an impact on child welfare and what that impact might be. And you also, I know from, from getting to see you in other counties, you also get to go to other child welfare agencies across the state and train child welfare workers on how to identify and screen potential victims of, of commercial of trafficking. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so Administration for Children and Families estimates that 90% of the domestic minor sex trafficking victims they've had contact with have been in the care of social services 
or child welfare at some point in their lives. And to me and to the department, that really indicates that we need to be focusing resources, training, and time. Um, so the department has really made it a, a priority to make sure that our staff gets training. So all staff who work with children um, within the child welfare department are required to take a three and a half hour training on the basics of CSEX, sex trafficking, how to screen and how to respond. And then we have a pretty comprehensive approach to screening anytime a child goes missing, anytime a child returns, and anytime a child has indicators that they might be um, a, victi a victim of CSEC or affected by CSEC, we screen them and we upload that into our system and we try to keep some really good data on um, on who's been affected, what counties see different populations, gender, um, age range, who's been affected of trafficking. So we are we have a really comprehensive approach to um, sex trafficking victims in the Department of Human Services. I really want to get to, you mentioned missing children. I really want to get, get to talk about this a little bit because I think there's, there's a lot floating around online. It's hard to sort through um, all the information. But before we do, I, I just want to share for the viewers and listeners, um, if you could give us also just a little bit of your professional experience prior to taking this position, because I know I've known you for a very long time. I know all the hats that you've worn leading up to this space. And so you bring an incredible amount of knowledge and wisdom from this field um, to child welfare. Would you mind sharing with everybody a little bit what, about what you've done before this? <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, it always just feels so funny to, to brag about this when it's such hard work and we're really in it for the kids or to talk about what I've done. But um, I'm coming up on a decade in this work, 10 years of doing this work. And um, I think I met you pretty close to the start of my career in working in counter trafficking. So I started with an organization that was going into strip clubs and getting to know women working in clubs and just offering resources and support to them. And um, then moved on to an international um, organization that they do work both uh, nationally and internationally. Um, created a, a documentary to be used in schools because we were getting requests on requests to talk to children and youth about this issue uh, while I was there and also worked to get some laws passed in Oregon. Um, and from there, I went on to be the director of a safe house here locally uh, and then um, was working in prevention education in schools again around trafficking and doing some school social work. And then into my role currently, um, I came on to DHS in, seven, uh, in 2017 in this role, which was created out of some legislation that um, mandated screening, training, and then my role was actually part of that to make sure that we had someone coordinating our CSEC response. And we have hit the streets to do outreach together before. Actually, that was one of the times we were doing street outreach in downtown Portland. And I don't really remember this pimp yelling at us. Yes. You remember this? He was standing outside of the 7-Eleven. He was like, I see you. I see you. Do you remember that? Yes. And I remember being uh, circled to be picked up by a John who had a Jesus fish sticker on his car. So that was real interesting as well. For That's sure. Yeah, I forgot, I forgot about that. For a while, I ran my own nonprofit where we were doing street outreach. We were just out there when people were working in the life yeah. and contact and support if it was, you know, getting a quick meal or um, we had one lady ask for a pair of shoes. So we met her next week with a pair of shoes that we got her um, and worked pretty closely with Portland Police Bureau on that. Their prostitution coordination team was what it was called at the time. And we would work together on getting support and resources for victims from that. Yeah. And, and a lot of these things that you've done weren't just um, in their own vacuum. They work simultaneously. While you're doing street outreach and strip club outreach, you're also running a, a safe home at, during the day, moonlighting as this outreach coordinator at night, um, just really active and involved in the community. I think not only because we all care so much, but because we're also all friends that sometimes it's like, hey, do you want to do outreach and then go grab a bite? You know, and it becomes like you just... You love to be able to help people. You love your work. And, and I know um, it's just fun to be able to work in a space that you enjoy, like your, your, your colleagues. And um, it's easier to get through some really hard times. And you also ran a safe home for a while. And I, I would love, and that was for adult women. And I would love to hear your perspective on this notion. And we hear this often, especially when we're talking about trafficking. It's like people make this disconnect between trafficking and adult women in prostitution that want to be there. Can you talk a little bit about that spectrum and nuance and, and, it, and do women, 
you think really want to be there? Or is this some series of lack of choices? Or, you know, maybe share the spectrum of child trafficking all the way to adult prostitution. Sure. Uh, Do you want me to define those for you? Sure. Okay. (laughs) So, um, (laughs) so, uh, as far as exploitation or sex trafficking of minors, um, you would be looking for, it's the recruitment, harboring, transportation, provision of patronizing or soliciting a minor for a sex act. So I can break that down much more easily than that federal definition. Please do. Uh, anytime a, a minor is exchanging a sex act for a place to stay, for f- food, for money, for transportation, um, that m- is what makes the sex act commercial. So that's where we get to that piece. And then um, anytime that someone is providing them, transporting them, making them available for um, a commercial sex act or patronizing or soliciting that minor for a commercial sex act, they in turn become the trafficker. They're the third party person who is, when I say providing, that's the person posting the ads, that's the person setting up the hotel rooms, that's the person making this child walk the track or an area of town where prostitution takes place. Um, And so that is that third party provider who's also benefiting from that child, taking their money, um, controlling them in some way. And so if a child is under 18, they don't get a choice as to whether they can work in the commercial sex industry legally or not. They don't, they're not old enough to consent. So under 18, you do not have to prove force, fraud, or coercion like you would for an adult. It is just, if they are involved in any of those, if they're involved in a commercial sex act, we're trying to figure out who is posting the ads, who's getting the hotel room. Right. Transporting, harboring, obtaining, procuring. What, you know, you and I have, you know, from the from panels we've set on together i've heard you would, we actually testified at senate bill um 673 673 in 2014 to pass the law in in oregon and i want to get to that in a minute because you do a really great job about what some of these review boards are saying buyers are saying um but before that you have shared um you know what is what is this a criminal 13 year old mastermind that can like right. You know, we, we've discussed this or it's like, we've both been like, what, what are they masterminds that they can like create a credit card, drive a vehicle. Like there is someone else that's involved. Um, it doesn't matter if they're not, if the child, you know, quote unquote is keeping the money. If someone is obtaining, transporting, procuring, um, harboring a minor into sex, into any form of commercial exploitation, it's illegal. Um, doesn't matter if they're not the ones personally getting something of monetary value, though they may be as well. I just, it's, yeah, it's so many, la- it's so many layers. So go all the way from that spectrum up to keep going. Sorry. Yeah, and I, <laughs> I have so many questions. I'm, I'm making notes for those of you that are watching. I'm not texting. I'm writing. Okay. On a napkin. That's all. <laughs> so with transportation, I want to point out too, either for a child or adult, I don't mean across state lines. I don't mean to India or Africa necessarily. I mean, did they drive them to a hotel room? Did they drive right. them to a date? Did they drive them to this person's house? Um, that is what transporting really means when we're talking about domestic sex trafficking. And so we all have this idea that, oh, well, it's only, I mean, I even heard today, well, it's, it's trafficking because they came from Washington into Oregon. No, it's trafficking because that person is uh, using a child for commercial sex. Um, it's right. not because it crossed the border, that doesn't magically make it trafficking. So I think that's if anything, important. it might make it move to a federal case, not a state right. case, but it doesn't make it trafficking. Yeah, it's driving someone from the house to the hotel. That's, that's transport. Yeah. Right. We, we use the terms also like point of recruitment, point of destination. And so if I recruit somebody in a mall and then I drive them to a hotel, that is right? Fraud at point of recruitment, potential force at point of destination, like during the transport. So there's all these like legal terms. When you have someone just tell the story, you can start identifying like, oh, okay, force at point of destination, transport, transporting, got it, you know? But um, unless someone's learning all of those phrases, it's hard to identify. It's almost like putting um, like the story math equation <laughs> to, the, to, the, to the legal definition, you know what I mean? Yeah. And I think, you know, people just really have to kind of get exposed to it and experience it. It is so hard when people post things online to know what's truthful and what isn't. Um, And so you really just have to get into it and learn from people who have been working in it. What is the language that they're using and what, um, you know, how are they defining these things? And that's who we need to sort of be focusing on. So for an adult, it's recruitment, harboring, transportation, provision of, so not the soliciting or patronizing, 
um, for the purpose of a commercial sex act using force, fraud, or coercion. So I'm going to just give you a, a few examples based on true scenarios that I've seen. So let's say we have an 18 year old woman, she's working in a strip club. So that in and of itself is she's, it's a commercial sex act, right? She's getting paid to work at the club. She's getting tips at the club. And so she's working in the commercial entertainment or sexual commercial sexual entertainment industry, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that in and of itself, if there were no other factors in that, that would be considered part of the legal commercial sexual entertainment industry. That is legal in Oregon. However, if she felt she had no other choices, you know, that would be something that we would take a look at. Does she feel like that's the only thing she can do or the only thing she knows how to do? That might be where you really come down to, is it actually a choice or is it where she's taken what life has handed her I didn't feel like she had the resources to pursue another opportunity. Now let's add in um, to a boyfriend who is coercing her, um, which coercion is a threat of force, use of force, um, violence towards someone. So let's say he's threatening her that if she doesn't go work at the club, doesn't go work this shift, um, he's going to withhold something from her. She, he's, she's not going to get to eat or she's not um, he's not going to pay her phone bill or um, he's going to do something to her if she doesn't go work her shift. There you add in the coercion piece. So you ha already have a commercial sex act. We've added in coercion. Um, and so he is also benefiting from her working in the club because she's paying for the apartment. There is when you have a legitimate sex trafficking case of an adult woman because you meet all of the benchmarks. You meet commercial sex act, you meet <clears throat> forced fraud or coercion, and you meet that third party benefactor where he's gaining money from her working in the club. Right. Fairness. Thank you so much. You gave us so much info. I was literally taking notes on a napkin like crazy. <laughs> so much good stuff you gave. I really appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. See you soon. Bye. You guys, that's a wrap. I want to thank our sponsor, Hashtag Reality Check It, for bringing all of this information to you today. Please make sure you check out our YouTube page where all of these guests have their entire full-length interview. And if you like what you're hearing and you like what you're seeing, please share it on social media, tag a friend. We want to get this information out to everybody that's interested in this topic. And stay tuned for an upcoming podcast where we export all of this into anywhere where you watch your favorite shows. Thanks again. Have you ever wondered what it's like to start over with nothing? Human trafficking. It's the largest social justice issue of our time. What happens to women and children after they escape, after they complete a program? How do you start life over again with a renewed sense of purpose? Elevate Academy was birthed from that. Elevate is an online school that offers courses, mentors, small groups, in-person chapters, homework activities, and job opportunities. So that survivors of human trafficking can start to actually dream again and then create steps to get there. By partnering with us financially every month for one year, you not only change the course of a survivor's life, but also her children and her children's children. But it doesn't stop there. 